to uh, me. Uh, I just want to kind of give you guys a shout out because you guys are already ahead of the curve. Um, you know, we'll dive into the business here a little bit of how golf instruction keeps changing because uh, it is evolving. Um, it's obviously turned into a career path of strictly teaching, which uh, was very new from when I jumped into the business. Uh, but kind of give you guys a, a quick little insight of me. I know you had Labritz on here recently, so I'm probably the complete opposite end of the spectrum of Rob. Um, I grew up more just being obsessed with golf instruction. Um, obviously played junior golf, played collegiate golf, um, but I really never, I mean, PGA Tour was never even in my brain. Um, so I grew up, uh, I grew up at Smithtown Landing Country Club um, out here on Long Island. So if any of you guys know, that is the home of uh, the old man, Michael Hebron. Um, so Michael, master professional, um, a little fun fact about Michael, he actually started the PGA Summit, a uh, teaching summit, um, way, way, way back before I was even born. <laughs> um, so I, I had a really head start on things. So um, Michael gave me my first job picking his range at nine years old. Um, so at nine years old, I was picking range balls for free golf. Um, and that, that's pretty much how I got into golf. But what happened by the time I was a freshman in high school, uh, still not getting paid to pick the driving range. Um, I asked Michael if I can, uh, if I could shoot video on his instruction. Um, and at that time he was teaching Ian Woosnam, um, who at that time was an absolute star, uh, from Wales, um, had a huge Ryder cup moment the year that I started watching Michael teach. So, uh, Michael taught me a uh, real big golf machine guy at the time. Um, you know, if you do any research on Michael now, he, he does a lot of research, um, of his own on how the brain works and how, uh, compatible learning with the brain in the instruction. But for me, I learned the golf. I read the golf machine at 13 years old, cover to cover. Um, and I was supposed to recite all the accumulators and everything that goes with the golfing machine. Um, and that was my book through high school. I really didn't care much about school. Um, I was sprinting out of school as quickly as possible to get down to Smithtown Landing and watch more and talk more. And Michael was amazing with his time. Uh, Michael spent a lot of time with Ben Hogan, um, spent a lot of time uh, with Mac O'Grady. Um, so really, he was a golfing machine guy. Ben Doyle was his big guy. So that's how I got into instruction. Um, so right after college, I'd say 21 years old, I moved down to Orlando, Florida. Um, and worked for David Ledbetter for a year. And uh, while I was with David, I realized I didn't want to work at an academy. I wanted to be at a country club. I'm a Met section kid. I, I grew up in the Met section. Playing was important to me. Um, and I didn't want to sit and just do golf schools. I want to do things a little bit different um, to what really irked me about it. And, and David was amazing. But what really irked me, and you guys will notice this uh, once you leave school, is giving 30% money back to the house uh, never sat well with me. Um, and, and at that point I was just stacking balls, but that was something that never really sat well with me. Um, so what happened was I went and worked at Calusa Pines down in Naples, Florida, and I worked for Eden Foster, who some of you might know that name, but Eden's the head pro at Maidstone. It's been there for maybe 22 years, but he opened up Calusa Pines and that was my real start in the country club world, right? I didn't know anything really about the high-end private. Um, and, you know, at this point, I didn't do much video stuff. I was, you know, again, I was a Michael Hebron disciple. We didn't do video. Uh, it was ball flight laws. Um, it was really watching where the ball started, where the ball ended. Um, and, again, utilize my stuff from the golf machine. So Eden really helped me get into the high-end private world and learn what those lessons looked like. And then I'd say my biggest break, Shay, you'll appreciate this one. My biggest break happened three years later when I got an assistance job at Fresh Metal Country Club by a new head pro named Matt Dobbins. And um, it was really cool. So we had Dobbs. Dobbs just won the Long Island Open the year prior. He was at Deepdale with Daryl. Um, really awesome opportunity for me. Again, guys, I had no idea where I was going in the industry. I had head pro in my brain at this point. And uh, to put it lightly, I was horrible at the operation. <laughs> and Shay, you'll appreciate that, throwing that back to Matt, and he'll echo that. I was 
absolutely dreadful as an assistant golf professional. Um, and I, and I realized that quickly. So year two, I remember sitting down with Matt at the end of the year and Matt's like, listen, man, like you got to teach golf. Like that's, that's your bread and butter. You got to teach golf. And I remember this, I was 24 years old at the time, 24 or 25, right around then. And he goes, listen, you got to learn how to teach with technology. He goes, until you learn how to teach with technology, you're just going to be another guy. Um, and when you have, when you have knowledge of something that the generation prior to you do not have, that's a huge plus. And when you can measure something and, and the whole term of measure, don't guess really didn't come out yet. Um, and this was, you know, this is the day of track man. Swing catalyst wasn't even a thing yet. Um, so Matt, you know, I'm indebted to Matt uh, forever. And uh, I remember when Matt got the phone call to go to Meadowbrook, um, it was, it was a very weird moment because I was established as a teacher already but I wasn't quite ready to work for somebody else. I mean, at that point, Matt was family, Lori was family. And uh, I stayed at Fresh for a short time and then COVID hit. Um, and when COVID hit, they shut down the courses. I, I, I don't know if you, that happened to you guys, wherever you were, but to us, we couldn't, we couldn't show up to work. I couldn't teach golf and that's how I made my money. Um, so, you know, what you can see behind me is I opened up my own studio and I'm currently in my garage. Um, so I, uh, I turned this into, into a business, um, and my business changed from teaching members to teaching club pros and teaching collegiate players and teaching touring players. Um, so it really changed. And, you know, again, that had a lot to do with, I went all over the place and you guys are going to, you guys are going to talk to golf professionals, whether it's teaching or head pros that had these direct routes, whether they went to Marion and Shinnecock and all these, all these huge amazing golf, uh, golf courses to put in their resumes and they end up in a great place. Mine was, mine was a little different. Mine was a little bit of luck. Um, I was exposed to teaching very early. I knew I loved to teach and, you know, I was, I was pretty good. I think largely because I was a good player. I then went really, really bad through working with the wrong person. And I think that really helped me as a coach. And then during my time at Fresh, when I, I mean, I was playing so bad at one point, I, uh, I went online and I Googled Mac O'Grady. I started finding more ad stuff and we'll dive into that in a moment. And uh, I flew to Japan and I booked a flight in August of, the, of a year. And uh, I went for a three day trip and I came back uh, just before season the following year in March. So I, uh, I spent a lot of time with Mac. Um, and to this day, I think I've been to 18 schools of Mac. Um, there's only two guys who have been to more schools than me and they're at 20 and their names, Mike Bennett and Andy Plummer. So, uh, my goal is to get to 20. <laughs> so that's a little bit, that's a little bit about me guys. I'm excited to kind of dive deep. Um, I was in your guys position, what feels like yesterday. Um, and the first thing I'd say is Shay, before we really dive into this is, uh, there's no such thing as a dumb question, guys. There really, really isn't. The best thing about instruction is just sharing ideas. Um, you know, in this world we're in right now, there's so much information. To me, the skill of coaching is speaking. And how you deliver the message is usually more important than what the message is. So, Shay, floor is yours. You tell me where we're going to head this thing. Sounds good. That was an awesome introduction, Joe. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit, a little bit more about Joe is he's going to open up a uh, 15,000 square foot facility with 12 track man simulators, three force plates, gears, a 3000 square foot putting green with three pup views. I mean, talk to us a little bit behind, uh, how this came about number one and what brought you here? Yeah. So, um, it's a good question. What brought me here? Uh, so once I opened up the studio during COVID, um, I went from charging $160 an hour to $300 an hour. And I was booked solid. Um, and I started doing eight hours a day, uh, six days a week. And shortly after I had a wait list, I got up to four months. So a student of mine, um, very, very successful Wall Street guy, um, kind of said to him, said to me one day, he's like, listen, you need more instructors. You need to train instructors. Um, and we want to create a studio that has all the bells and whistles that you have 
but in every single base. So not only in the lesson do we get to use these things, but we can work on these things such as TrackMan or the force plates on their own time. Um, and then as we started doing some market research on it, we felt a lot of places, and again, the Met section, guys, I don't know how many of you have studied in the Met section so far, but um, as a whole, the Met section doesn't have the best practice facilities. Um, Shay, I know at Meadowbrook, they certainly do, but as you travel and you play events, I'm sure you notice that there's some real dungy, crappy <laughs> driving ranges. So for us, we felt uh, the fact that you can wear whatever you want and practice whenever you want is a huge was a huge piece um we felt that um the clientele in the long island area really valued technology they really valued the feedback and technology and how to use it um and then lastly what i noticed through my years of kind of cultivating this this product this matrix that i've created in my coaching that we feel like it's very easy to train coaches this this process and this teaching way to uh, to reach even larger masses. And the mindset here, and we're trying to get uh, get our feet wet first, but the mindset here is to build quite a few of these from Chicago down to Philly, up to Long Island, uh, into Westchester. But ultimately, the way this idea came about was by mistake, to be honest with you. And that's kind of what you figure out along the way is what's successful. Um, how can you make money with working, not killing yourself a hundred hours a week? Um, and for my mindset was I wanted to play more golf, right? So the way I did it is I flipped the seasons. I said, all right, I'll be busy in, in January. And in August, I'll go play a ton of golf with, with my client, with my clients at their courses. Awesome. <clears throat> so uh, we'll just kind of dive into a couple questions as a teacher specifically. So kind of just take us through and describe the ins and outs and the secrets of starting your own golf business. Yeah. I mean, listen, I think you guys are in a very, if you decide to go the teaching route and most likely most of you will start as an assistant and really learn how much you love coaching. If you, if you do, um, and just, you'll realize, Hey, I make a lot more money teaching golf than running tournaments. Right. And if you're, if you're that guy that says, Hey, listen, I want to jump into, I want to full blown jump deep into teaching. Well, it's creating the knowledge first, right? So the fir first and foremost at, at the top of the pillar to me is find right now, when you're in school, find who you really like, get on Instagram, utilize Instagram and find the coaches that speak to you. Now, to me, it was always golf machine guys. So I fell in love with the Dana Delquist of the world. Um, I really appreciated Mike Bennett and Andy Plummer a lot. Um, so th those are guys that really spoke to me. So then I've studied with uh, Terry Rolls and Mike Adams, for example. And what they're doing in their camp is amazing, right? They're, they're creating this biomechanics and really measuring parts of your body. And you would fit into... Uh, a specific model, if you will, that will help you get there quicker. That never spoke to me. Um, and I love those guys. They're, they're dear friends of mine, and I've sent students to them. But the way my brain works, I speak in a very golf machine, morad way. Um, I like the P system a lot. Um, but that's how I see golf swings. So when I'm, on, when I'm out there on tour, I like the Charles Howell swings. I like the Robert Rock swings. I like Alex Norin swings. Like those are swings that, that mean much to me. And in my time with Mac, that's, that's why I went to Mac because he spoke the language that, that I spoke and felt as a kid. So I think that's a big piece for you guys as you're growing up is don't be scared. A lot of, a lot of coaches will tell you, don't get caught up in, in a swing philosophy. Don't get caught up in swing theories. And I'd say that's BS. You know, and that's me. That's just my own opinion. I really felt that um, rather than being all over the place, like if a guy, if a guy calls me up or sends me an email and he comes and takes a lesson with me, he knows what he's getting. Right. Um, if you go on Mike Bender's page right now and you look how busy Mike Bender, I mean, his followers are through the roof right now. You think you don't know what you're getting with Mike Bender. You know exactly what you're getting with Mike Bender. And I think at a certain point in your career, I'm not saying day one. But at a certain point in your career, that's okay. That's okay to, for people to know what type of system that they're going in. 
Now, my students don't like, we'll get into Ryan here in a minute. But if you take Ryan and you take uh, another my guy, James Alden, who plays for Guilford down by you guys, you take James, right? Two very good players. They look so different swinging the golf club and they always will. So that's not to say that it's a cookie cutting approach, but there is a systematic approach to how we're breaking these swings down. And for me as a coach, that has led to serious success with me of people knowing what they're going to get, knowing what language I'm going to speak. Um, and for them learning how to diagnose their golf swing as quickly as I can, because of the system that we created. So the first thing I would say to you guys, when you ask questions as a teacher, creating a business, you better have the knowledge, right? There, there's coaches that you go on their Instagram one day and then you go a month later and it's like, whoa, that he just went from a George Gankis conversation, right? And now all of a sudden he's in this camp and it's like, okay, but where's, where's the common? And I think that's a very important piece to understand. And that's stuff you guys should be looking at, right? Go on Instagram, really big names and not really big names and say, Hey, what are they doing? Well, what are they not doing? Well, um, and, and to me, I think a big thing that I've done that I've stayed true to really probably five years into my time at fresh. And I learned this, I said, you know what? Those are my coaches that I'm going to go watch. Those are my coaches. I'm going to go study. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to look at their stuff on YouTube. I still go back on YouTube and, I, and I'll look at old Mac O'Grady stuff. Um, I'll go on and I'll look at uh, Chuck Cook stuff because I know Chuck Cook is a guy who's going to talk the language that I'm speaking. So that to me, I found very important. I know that goes totally against what most people will tell you guys, um, but that's worked for me. Right. I, I'm not going to go uh, who's uh, Jim Hardy. Right. I love those guys down there. I think the Jim Hardy guys are fantastic, but it doesn't speak my language. Right. And if you go work for McLean right out of college, um, which would open up doors that you never realized were possible. But you go in and work for a McLean, he'll tell you, find a guy you disagree with and go research him. Go watch him teach and figure out why you don't like him. For me, I felt like that was a waste of time. I'd rather go to the guys that are teaching this type of way. How are they doing it so well? And how can I be better at it, but speak in that world? Now, side note, probably has a lot to do with my time with Dobbins because Matt worked with a guy named Jeff Geschwin at Deepdale and Jeff Geschwin is in that world. So again, it sat in my brain correctly. Um, that's a big piece. Now, as far as building a business guys, are there any girls on here, Shay? Or is this all guys? I want to be politically correct if I say guys. <laughs> Let me check here. We, we have two females in our program, but it doesn't look like either one. All right. So I, I want to be politically correct. So, so stop me if I'm not. Um, so, so that's a big piece. Then it goes to customer service, right? You need to make that person in your time, in your studio, in your hitting bay, feel like they are literally the only person you care about. That, that is the trick of creating a book. You text them randomly throughout the day. If you're bored, you're sitting at lunch, text them. Just text them back. Hey, listen, just want to just want to hit you up, see how everything's going. Let me know how, how things, if you have any questions, let me know. The simplest thing. I mean, there was a point at Fresh, I was copying pasting the same message. <laughs> Literally, it was copy and paste the same message, everybody. I wouldn't write down their names specifically just for that reason. Copy, paste, copy, paste. So, so that's a really big piece to it. Um, in this day and age, it's super easy, but um, sending video recaps is gigantic. Um, you know, TrackMan, you can do that. Swing Catalyst makes it super easy. But we'll get into Swing Catalyst here in a minute, which you guys will be absolutely floored by. But the Swing Catalyst, I will send that video to somebody. Every person I send it to sends it to five or six of their guys. And everyone is in a text chain with their buddies at their club that they play with. And that video goes into that text chain. So like if I went, let's just say I went and taught at Pine Needles tomorrow and I wanted to start teaching all these guys at Pine Needles, it would take me, I think, two weeks to build a book. I, I would be book solid within a month simply because of the way that I treat that. So you don't have to be a great coach to do that. Um, me, and when I mean by great coach, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room to do that. Um, stay true to yourself. Keep it simple in the beginning. But the big thing is the customer service that you'll learn from being a head pro, right? And all those things. 
I took what I learned at the customer service aspect of a high-end private club, and I put that into my teaching. And, you know, everyone you talk to that I teach um, will literally tell you. And, and most of the time I feel, I, I love it so much and they feel that through me, but the energy that I give, I make them literally feel like they're my only student. And I think that's really, really important. Um, holiday comes around, everyone's getting a holiday card. Um, in my swing cat, I have their birthdays. They get automatic emails, happy birthday. Like it, it's the little stuff like that, that I know the, ne- the other guy's not doing. And I know if they're bought that much into me, they're going to work that much harder. Now, the other end of it is I'm a bastard in the lesson. I mean, I, am, I had a guy today for three hours, we did grip. For three hours, we did grip, right? And I'll probably do that for a month on him. But again, they know, and my selling point to them, I tell them all the time, I go, listen, if you come in here as a 15 handicap and you leave here as a 13 handicap, that does nothing for my business. If you come in as a 15 and you leave as a six, that does something for my business. So for that, you know, that's the customer aspect. And they learn to know that. And then in this day and age, again, I don't need to tell you guys this, but in this day and age, man, does that spread like wildfire? Now, on the other end, if you're just teaching them and you don't talk to them or you don't communicate with them at all after their lesson, that spreads like wildfire, right? So the question is, who are you going to be? Are you going to be the coach that thinks it's all about technique and mechanics? Or are you going to be the coach that understands this is a way of life that they want? Like Ryan Ripberger, who we'll dive into, Ryan Ripberger lives on golf. And what I mean by that is if he comes into me and he's hitting a block, and he leaves and he's hitting a hook, I just destroyed his college career. Destroyed it, right? If he comes in here and he creates the, the driver yips in a week, I mean, it, it might as well be a heart surgeon killing somebody. And, and that's really how I look at it at, at every level. You know, it sounds crazy, a 20 handicap, you're like, listen, the guy slices the ball 100 yards. Well, I look at it as that's my responsibility to fix that. Um, and, and it's a serious responsibility that I take. I think that's something I didn't realize early on in my career, but you know, what you guys got to think about is if you go and take a lesson with somebody and it downright sucks and you know, that lesson was horrible and you're not sure of it. Imagine you being that coach now, right? Imagine you being the person who did that. You never go back and you'll tell five people that will never go back. So the biggest thing as a coach is gain the knowledge and then ride that knowledge in with a huge amount of customer service and make that individual feel like you're part of their family. Right. And I think that, I mean, literally I'm sending these guys, I have group chats of pods of people that are students of mine that I'm constantly just sending messages to uh, whether, you know, it's, it's Cantley going seven under through seven today. Right. I'll go to those guys and say, I bet you a thousand dollars right now. You can't bogey seven holes in a row. Like I, I literally, I mean, you give it to them hard, but listen, that that's the relationship you're trying to create. So I think that has really helped me um, get there. And, and, you know, in the Mets section, you've got a tremendous amount of coaches in the Mets section, right? So there's a lot of, and everything's so close together, right? There's other sections that you might drive four hours and you're still in the same section, right? So the Mets section, everything's very tight together, but um, that has been a really big separator for me. And remember, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in literally in my house teaching golf. So for me to get someone, they have to go get their bag, they have to throw it in the car, they have to go drive 30 minutes to me to take an hour lesson and go drive back home, right? So for me, it's that much more important that A, they're getting better at golf quickly, and then B, that they feel like they have that pro. They have that, they have that guy that's their buddy that will go play golf with them at the same time as teach them. So yeah. how, how does someone like him who – jumps off the ground as aggressively as he, as he does, how does him not being connected to the ground affect his golf swing? How does he use his feet so properly? Well, the big question is who says he's not connected to the ground, right? It would be the start. You know, what we're looking at there is, and I assume this is what you mean, is that left foot's off the ground. And you're saying to yourself, wow, where, how is he doing that, <laughs> right? Or why, excuse me, why is he doing that? Um, and the big answer is the, the ground force are way gone by this point. That's the ground put, punching back at him, right? So 
the big question is with Justin, and I know for a fact, Justin had no idea what a force plate was growing up. Um, I spoke to Justin about this. And the big thing about what's happening here is if you look at where his left shoulder is, his left shoulder is significantly higher than his right shoulder. So his force of his left shoulder pulling up and back, okay, is actually opening up his hip. And his, his foot is spinning back because of how he pushed down and that left shoulder pulled up and back. So Dobbins does that pretty much exactly how JT's doing that, right? Is when he's pulling that left shoulder up and back, that takes the shaft and gets all the energy out of that shaft at the right time. So you can't drag it. And when this left shoulder is pulling up, the energy from his toe is going literally up his knee, up his hip, all the way up into his left shoulder. And that's why his arms are perfectly released at that point of the golf swing. So the question is, well, how did he do that? Right. And it happened way, way back in the golf swing as he was pushing down in his left foot on the backswing. Right. As he creates that amount of tilt that he creates as he pulls up, think about it as an uppercut. Right. So if you just went and you did a huge uppercut, look how my left shoulder just pulls up out of the way. And that's ultimately what he's doing. So he's getting low and then he's pulling up. Um, but, but again, that's judging. We don't have his data. That's judging based on just the, the training of the eye, seeing enough of these. But he's, you're going to see um, a lot of guys. I mean, Bryson does the same thing. These guys want to spin their left foot out because that's what's getting the energy back out of the club into their body. Awesome. Now I think we want to take a look at um, Ryan's swing. We'll have you share your screen here in a second. But so the, for the people who don't know, Ryan Ripperger, he's a college athlete at St. John's University, just played in the Met Open at Hudson National. Hits it a long way. Uh, you'll see some of his numbers here. But uh, here's his footwork at a couple positions. And Joe, kind of take us through what his, uh, his transition is looking like here in the feet. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> you know, Ryan came in here and, uh, you know, I was working with his dad for a while. And his, his father's the head pro at Garden City Golf Club um, up here in the section. And his father won the Met Open um, at Bethpage Black, actually, uh, quite some time ago. But nonetheless, he won it at Bethpage Black. And uh, his father was averaging at like 240 off the tee when he hit it, when he won black. So it shows you how on fire his wedge game was. Uh, you really, you really like step back and appreciate that. But anyway, so Bob, um, we, we were, we, we've been grinding Bob. I mean, probably three, four days a week, really been going after Bob, getting his speeds going. Um, so anyway, so Ryan, Ryan came back from, uh, from college, uh, which is only, 40 minutes probably from here. And, uh, you know, he wanted to pick my brain and w understand why he wasn't as successful of a driver of the golf ball as he wishes he would. Now, Ryan has a tremendous amount of club head speed, like Shay just mentioned, a tremendous amount of club head speed. Um, just doesn't know where the hell the thing's going, right? So what you'll notice on the, uh, if you're looking at the screen, and this is going to be a fun one, so buckle up for this one, guys. It's the, the furthest one to our left, if you're looking at the screen, you can see you don't have to be a golf swing savant to realize that his right hip really swayed back underneath him, right? Um, to where his, his, his pelvis moved right and so much so that his spine actually went into almost a reverse pivot. So he makes it look a little bit better than, than that happens, but that is what happens. So his weight gets tremendously on the outside of his right foot. Um, and again, you can see that probably pretty clearly. If it, you don't even need a force plate to get to that point. So then what happens is his hips in the middle, the middle photo there have to get super underneath him. But the problem with this pattern is for a guy, <laughs> excuse me, a guy like Ryan is he's dragging the hell out of that golf club. I mean, he is dragging that thing so hard that he has no clue where that club face is. Now on the right, you could see he got it out. But if that picture was at impact guys, imagine you put a lob wedge outside of your right foot and your hands in the middle of your stance and you cocked it up as hard as you can, you drag it forward. That's Ryan at impact. So hold on one second. So if you could see this here, 
Can you see that? There you go. He was at impact here. So his loft that he was playing on his driver was 12 degrees. Okay. His shaft was stiffer than a, a telephone pole. So he's going stiff, but he needs the bottom of that club to kick. So I'm like, wait, Ryan, what are you, what are you doing? This is horrible. So then I go, I go, what is your goal after college? My goal after college is to chase and play professionally. Okay. Okay. So it's not me getting him to just play the best golf he can now. It's me developing Ryan into utilizing this as a strength. So the, the thing before we jump into his swing on here is I want you guys to understand this thing that he told me and put yourself in my position for a second. He hits his driver about 330. Just put that, put that flies at about 330. He's about 118 miles an hour, 117 miles an hour. So he can hit it 330. The problem is he can hit it 100 yards left or 100 yards right. Right. So based on the droop of the club, the deflection of the club, that ball can go any side. So his two iron goes 275. Okay. That's in the air, 275. Now imagine what we know now. What is his two iron at impact loft wise? The answer is nine degrees. Right. So we have a little problem there too, because he's de lofting the living crap out of his iron, but that's an iron. Then he hates his three wood. So he tells me he hits his driver an average of three to four times around. So now I'm putting my Scott Fawcett hat on uh, from Decade Golf, and I'm saying to myself, Here's a guy who can fly at 330, 340 in the air. And he's putting in his bag. And he's hitting the club that goes 275. But that's his strength. His strength is distance. So he's donating all that distance. He's getting rid of it. And he's saying, okay, I want to hit it as far as the short guy out there and hit a 280. So he better get hot with that putter real quick or he's shooting 76, 77. And so, so I, so I'm having this conversation just like I am with you guys with him. And he's like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> right. And I'm telling him, I'm like, yeah, you can't play Beth page right on that one. Yep. Yeah. Yep, can't do that. Yep. So now here I'm going to myself, I go, okay, so here's a guy, Ryan Ruferger, who I believe is the final round of their fall event this year at Beth page red shot 64. And I think his opening round was like 78. So now you're talking about plus minus 10, 10 shots between these two, these two rounds or the possibility of plus minus 10, 10 shots around. And you say to yourself as a coach, you go, all right, I need to get this kid to play well for the spring. Cause his confidence is gone. It is gone. Right. Um, I need to get him by the summertime to where he's becoming one of the best players, uh, best college players, best players in the Mets section. How do I do that? He's got speed. The answer is, I need to change his footwork and I need to get rid of that drag of the club. So when we look at this, I want to show you guys what I did. We're going to start off with a before photo. Um, and I'm, I want this to more be a back and forth conversation. So again, this is where I say there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, I've seen many tour tour uh, players I've worked with to where I've seen high end swings this is a moment that you guys get to actually see a high end swing. So it is different when speed is involved. So ask away. So let's, uh, can we share my, my screen? Absolutely. All right, here we go. Let's go here. Swing cat. Um, can you guys, before I actually go there, can you, anybody use swing catalyst ever? Just raise your hand if you did or you didn't. No? Cool. Perfect. So you guys are going to have no idea what I'm talking about. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's have some fun here. Can you see this loading, Shay? Just to make sure it's on my page. Uh, does it give you the share screen option? Uh, where is my... Oh, here we go. Now I'm in there. Okay. Let me know if you could see it. Can you see it yet? Not yet. How about now? Nope. Oh, oh hold on. Should go to share screen. Host disabled participant screen share. Okay. It usually shows when I'm sharing. Hold on. Nothing? 
Hold on. Share again. Oh, oh, that was different. Okay, hold on. Here we go. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah? Okay. All righty. Let's pull up Ryan. This is going to be fun, boys. So we're going to go to his first swing that I've ever seen. Now, keep in mind, guys, when you watch this, you're talking about one strong son of a gun. I mean, his legs are some of the strongest legs I've ever seen. Okay, so let's go there. We're going to start with the iron first, just so you guys can kind of get an idea on, on what we've done. Let me go to where before I saw him. Okay, there we go. Okay. What video software do you guys use? Do you more V1s, JC video? What do you guys use? TrackMan? I mostly use TrackMan. I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but... So just so you guys understand, the, the main reason why I use Swing Catalyst is it captures everything on one screen. So when I send these things to people, it, that's very important to me. So you can see, like, I can throw my TrackMan stuff here at the bottom. Um, so, you know, when you send somebody something, you're sending them the video, you can send them the plate, and then you can send them the launch monitor. So um, if you don't, if you only have TrackMan, it's a no-brainer to just use TrackMan. Um, but just so you understand, in case anybody's wondering the why is there, that that's the reason why. Um, all right, so let's start here. All right, this is the same golf club, guys. These are both eight irons. Okay, so we're gonna get Ryan into his setup. All right, so. Ryan comes here on the right-hand side of the screen. So the first thing that jumped into my mind is, you know, let's see if I have the plate running on both. There we go. Is he's only 14.8 inches from big toe to big toe. So, it, you know, he's really narrow. <laughs> like, he's really, really narrow. Now, typically draggers of the club start from a very narrow position. Uh, you create a lot more side bend with a narrow stance, um, and therefore you really yank it on that left hand with, with that. Uh, typically, when you're talking about dragging, um, and if somebody doesn't know the term that I'm using, just let me know. But when you're talking about a dragger, you usually talk about a really good player. Um, th this is usually a good player issue, a high-end pro uh, player problem. So the big thing is you can see how different uh, the width of the stance is. Now, what you're going to really notice and what we're going to do a lot of here is what the pelvis or think about belt buckle, how the pelvis moves in the golf swing. This is the big thing that I that I found with Ryan is how does this pelvis move? So as he swings the golf club back, there's a lot of sway going on over there versus Ryan's new move. So you can see how much more rotation of the body we have gone mainly because of how his legs work. And as we get into the bigger swings and the faster swings, you'll see it even more. Um, but even in this swing, what I, what I'm trying to get more of, and we're going to is again, this core and this whole left side of his body to rotate more. Okay. So here, let me try to pull up one of these other ones here. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's look at this for a second. So you can really see the difference there in, in the rotation, but more so where the pelvis is. Okay. So again, what, what specifically what I'm looking at is look where this pelvis is pointing here on the left versus you can see the pelvis over here on the right. It hasn't really turned. It shifted, but it hasn't really turned. So a good view to look at it from here is we are at the top. Look at the shoulder difference. So now we got shoulders here. And you got lack of shoulder here. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so there we go there to there. So now look look at how his leg work is, is operating here. 
right? So there's, there's a lot of swaying to the outside of his right foot on the right. Now, largely has to do with his setup, right? He was too narrow to really do too much here. And you can see how much he's reverse pivoting there on the right hand side of the screen. But that, that ultimately, as we go down this, just understand that we're working a lot on his pelvis, right? So as we go down into more recent, take this swing here. This was a good one. So what we did a lot of is I shut him, I shut his stance down a lot, right? Drop that right foot back. And that allows us to get that pelvis to move a little bit more. So when you look at this from the face on, where am I here? Here we go. Now it kind of gives you a look on what we're trying to strive for here on how much more he's turning. So to me, the findings that I had was, hey, Ryan wasn't turning efficiently on the backswing. And turning probably isn't even the right word, but he wasn't tilting and bending properly on the backswing. And on the right-hand side, this is just an athlete playing golf. So literally all that was, was, was an athlete playing golf. So now if we dive deeper, and we don't show him you his literally his first swing, but we go into him being a little bit wider on his next lesson. And he got this pretty quick guys, just so you understand this. I mean, I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody change something so quick in my life. All right. So hold on. Where is that? Open. All right. He's still Daryl. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Here. That, that's actually a good one for you guys to show. So, but we'll come back to that. So you know what his swing looked like. So now let's go on his face on here. And so again, pretty wide, right? And you can see how different he's turning now. Okay, so by us moving that right foot back, that's us telling his brain, what are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? That's us telling his brain, hey, listen, your hips are pretty darn tight. We got to little by little stretch this out. Now, what you guys will notice is we've done, and this is an important piece here. We got him coming in tomorrow as well just to prove this point is we have, let's see how many lessons have I given him so far? Not a ton, but one, two, three, five lessons in five lessons. We've discussed the same thing. And, and that's very important for you guys. When you, when you get out here and you start teaching golf for a living, uh, or even if you're teaching golf during these internships is don't be scared to say the same thing for a year. <laughs> literally don't be scared of that i remember for me and, and i heard i heard speakers say this all the time is you know they would they would tell you that and here i am you know having a different thing every time um uh, maybe it's i forgot what we worked on because there was so many people in between you know so take your notes have a file and especially on better players really stay true to what you're working on and just don't doubt yourself on it Okay, it takes a moment. As Mac would always say, you never know what day it's going to click. You don't know. You, you can work with someone for a month straight and you just don't know when they're like, why the hell did it take me this long to figure that out? Right? You'll hear that all the time. So, like for Ryan, this is me just constantly, constantly just going after that cavity, going after that cavity, going after that cavity. So, part of it is a setup problem. Part of it is he has very stiff quads, he has very stiff hamstrings. Um, so, I got to do some drills on it. Part of it is just, it's just how he's always played golf, right? So you can see I've really flared open his right foot. You can see I dropped his right foot back. So I'm doing everything I can to open up that right hip for it to go the opposite direction. That, that's my sole goal here is here his hip would either stay straight right where it started or it would bump a little bit to the right. When that hip bumps to the right, it sends his spine the other way or what? Yeah. It bumps to my left, I guess, but away from the target, right? So you can really see now when we're looking at Ryan, these are two, these are the same or two different swings overlaid. I mean, look at look how different that body is now working. Right. So now let me just flip this over to the other side, just so you can see this from a different view. And you'll really appreciate here for a moment how different his hip is working. Right. So those glutes are really, really working now. Right. So now if I draw up my, my swing cat again, you see this gray dot down here, guys, if you can see this gray dot, that's his center of mass. 
So he is this center line right here is the center of his stance. Look how far with an eight iron he moved to the side. Now, this is a new one, but he's moving to the side a little bit because he has that shut stance. But look how much in his heel he's moving now. His feet were so light, it's barely. I mean, think about it. It's so light on the ground. He is using so little ground here that I don't even know where his right foot is. And I, and I think that in itself is really interesting. Look at over here on the left. I mean, we can clearly see the heat that's going on over there, right? So that's an important piece. Now, when we look at this specific swing, let's go back to the face on here. We'll start him here. Let's go there. I only really care about impact here. Look, look at this guy. Look at that drag, right? But way better. So now you can see his forces. So horizontal, vertical, rotational. Look how high this peak is in his rotational. This thing is almost off the chart, literally, right? And this is a six. Uh, this is an eight iron, and he's creating that much rotation. So it shows you why he's so strong. Now his verticals for us to get rid of that drag has got to be in this black part. So the more vertical you create, the more the energy gets thrown out of the shaft or at a, into the head. Okay, so now. Let's go into the driver. Where are we here? Is this a driver? Yeah, here we go. This is the fun stuff. Now we get into the fun stuff. All right. I wish I had you guys a before driver, but I didn't. Okay. So one, two. This is pretty new. When I when I found out we had to record this, I told him to get his ass in here and it hit some driver. So uh this is outside of a lesson, but again, so let's, let's go over these forces for a minute on the right. Uh, let's go to the middle graph, which is the blue graph. You see how there's peaks and valleys here. See how that goes high, low, high, low, high. That should be one constant peak and gradually fall down. So what you see is he's pumping the brakes in his feet for balance purposes, right? So this is something that we'll be constantly be working on. Now, for us to have these peaks this high is a huge deal, right? It's helping us here. But let's get, let's get to the swing and let's show you guys what I see. So when he first started, his shaft, just to show you guys this, his shaft was this red line. Okay, that's, that's number one. His spine was this uh, red line, probably won't be too smart there. His spine was very neutral and his shoulders were pretty level. Now, remember, he was also much narrower. But that's a good start for you. So remember, here's a guy who's a dragger. So we got this shaft to where it goes right through his head. And that, that, was, that was my goal. I wanted it working right through his, right through his head. Um, and the reason for that is the way a driver is built, which we'll get into another day. But it's remember, he has a 12-degree driver that he de-lofts. Well, he was essentially starting off with a de-lofted. Right? So, so that's number one. We got him a little wider. Now, remember... What we're working on is trying to get this pelvis to rotate around, okay? Not laterally, but to rotate around. So as he swings back, let's see what his pelvis is. There we go. That's some good turn by him. But you can see, you see how tight his lower body is, right? So he's got to do another 400 swings with that right foot back, right? And we'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples here on this from another guy soon. But, but the point is he's really swinging behind Again, behind the ball. Um, legs are getting better. But again, you can see how strong this guy is. Now, as he comes down, that's the shit. I mean, you look how, how good does that look right there? That thing is money. You can see how stretched out that left arm looks. You can see how on top of his left leg already he is. Okay. So now, as he keeps coming down, at this point, this shoulder has got to start going this way. And as the shoulder starts pumping this way, this leg starts to strain and this club gets thrown out, right? Or AKA the, the drag of the club gets thrown out. Right? so as he comes in, you can see he's holding on it. But if this shoulder was here, that club shaft would be here. And that, that's essentially what we're working on, right? Is understand that. But this is a tremendous difference from what you saw in the, from that Met Open swing 
And you can see, look how much more extended he is at that point because his energy is getting let out. Again, by season, which I think they're getting going mid-February, if I remember right. Shay, your brother's on the team, right? So you probably know that answer more than I do. But Correct. left shoulder should be behind his head at that point. If the left shoulder is behind his head, then that club gets thrown out even earlier. And then he gets himself into a really good follow through. So you can see that there's, there's some legit speed going on in this golfer. Um, right. So look, here's his club head speed. That's just him kind of swinging around his swinging at 120 miles an hour right there. Um, and that's him just working on pelvis. So here's a guy who's got a tremendous amount of club head speed. Um, but the good news is we finally got him to swing up on that ball um, from there. So what I, what I want to show you real quick is a different player. Um, and this is going to be a fun one for you guys. So this is the name Sean Quinlivan. So Sean just got the Shinnecock head pro job. He was at Piping Rock for quite some time. Hell of a player up here in the Mets section. Uh, possibly the biggest tinkerer in golf swings that I've ever been around in my entire life. Um, so Sean came in here at 104 miles an hour and his, uh, his high was 107. Okay. So just keep that in mind when I show you this. So now here's his club head speed. So in this one lesson, we got him 104, 107, right in that ballpark to almost 120. So I want to show you, cause this is possibly the greatest ground force work I've ever had. Okay, and there's gonna you're gonna see a lot of what we're trying to do with Ryan gets into this. Okay, so the first thing, and look at his graph, by the way, just to show you a different golfer, really peaking. I mean, his peaks are going all over the place, right? So as he takes this thing back now, watch his pelvis. See how much that turned? So we're allowing him to really make that turn in his pelvis, and that allows his shoulders to turn. Now, the fun part is coming here, right? So, Shay, you asked a question about Justin Thomas. This is very Justin Thomas-esque pattern. Watch how down he pushes now. Do you see that? So, he starts all the way up here. He squats down. Now, he pulls up with that left shoulder. See that left shoulder? Okay. And I'm going to show you, since we're on a Campbell call real quick, it wouldn't be a fun day without some uh, Ben Pollen conversations. So let's pull up Benny real quick. Um, just so you all know, I've never given Ben a golf lesson. This is just him, us measuring Benny up. So here we go. Let's check out his stuff. So now what I hope that you guys are starting to see is how different the graphs are. Okay nobody has the same graph. So that, that's what I really like about it. Uh, you're not trying to paint somebody into a specific corner. You're just trying to maximize what they do well already, try to get them to do that even better. So the first thing you'll notice about Ben is he has a lot of drag as well, doesn't he? Right, but it's what he does after impact with his left shoulder. So watch this, we'll go right here from P6 first. Let's just follow this left shoulder. And now it's gone. You see that difference? Right. So now if we throw Riot up back over here with the drivers. And we go to right to this spot here. Where's Ben's left shoulder? And let's go to Ryan here. A lot more chase going on over here on the right, isn't there? Right. You can see how he's getting thrown forward where Benny's going back more, his hips are much more forward and his spine is pushing more up. Now I talked to his coach, Brian Cregan and him and Cregan worked their butts off on that. Right. So just, just understand now, again, you're talking, this was Ben, gosh, maybe a year and a half ago. So I don't know how Ben is uh, 30, probably somewhere around there, 28, 29, 30, somewhere in that ballpark. And Ryan's probably 20, 19, 20, somewhere in that range. So you're talking about us developing Ryan and Ben almost towards the end of his full-time PGA Tour career. So, you know, one guy knows one thing, the other knows the other. But if you look at 
this this left arm that Ryan has over here. Oh, hold on. Go right down to here for a second. Boom versus watch the power difference here, boys. Look at that left arm. Look at those legs. So to me as a coach, when I looked at Ryan there, I said, oh boy, we could do a lot here. Um, and, and again, it's very important to understand, you know, we spent, I think it was five lessons. I said that was all in a seven day stretch. So I'm incredibly excited, uh, to what, where Ryan will probably be by, by probably May, June, you'll probably see him. I'd be upset if he didn't win the med am I'd be shocked if he doesn't win the med am or at least contend for the med am. Um, and I'd be really surprised if he doesn't go make a, a low am at like a state open or a med open move because he has the distance to do this. Now it's important to take the governors off, but have the control of the face. So again, you can, you can start seeing from the lens that I was looking at on this movement, right? See, you see how much more, how much more still Ben's lower body is. So now Ben, for the record, I don't know how many of you have seen him hit a ball. Ben actually nukes a driver. I mean, he absolutely shreds a driver, right? So it's not like we're comparing a fast guy versus a slow guy. Ben just has way more connection to the ground earlier um, into his golf swing. And his follow through speaks a lot more on where we're going with Ryan. And you can see a lot more of that chase. But again, this is like, think of Tiger Woods back in 97, 96, 97, his career on how loose his golf swing was. And then think about Tiger in like 04, 05 on how tight Tiger swing was. So that's, that's essentially how we see Ryan swing. But um, again, as a little coaching nugget here, you're not looking to do it all at one moment, right? You got to develop it. It's very important that it, it, even at that level, it's got to be slowly and gradually developed or else he's playing golf swing in a tournament, not playing golf in a tournament. So th those are kind of, uh, pretty, pretty important pieces. And then the last thing I want to show you before, if Shay, if you want to, if, if I'm taking too much time, just let me know. Um, this one's really interesting and I'll show you guys who this, who this gentleman is here in a moment. Okay. That's a good thing. So, um, West Hampton country club out here, uh, out in the Hamptons, um, assistant golf professional, Jeff Sullivan, um, this is Jeff, and I'm going to show you some really interesting stuff that we did here. So, because Shay, you, you talk about kind of how, how do I use the force plate? This is going to be a really good example on how we use the force plate. Okay, take that out. And then let's take this. So, um, here we go. So, Jeff is a pretty good friend of mine, um, but never really taking too many lessons from me. We never kind of got to that point. Um, but he comes to me and, and he honestly couldn't even break an egg. Right? I mean, with the driver, it was, it was dreadful. He literally stopped playing tournament golf up here. And what you'll see here is where he is at impact, right? There's literally nothing happening at impact. There's his legs aren't working. His torso isn't working. His spine isn't, there's nothing being moved into the ground. Okay. So so then what happens is we bring him into this swing and we do some, we do some work here and he thinks I'm crazy doing this. So what I have him do is I physically have him step out of the, out of the box and I make him do some swings. And so what am I doing? I'm creating a force that creates more torque or rotation, but tells his brain it's okay to open. Right. So the question is, as a coach, do you say, OK, you sit there and say, all right, Jeff, we got to open those hips. You got to make some swings. You're open those hips. Well, he knows that. Hell, he's a teaching pro for crying out loud. He knows his hips should be open at that time, but yet they're not opening. So the question is why. And, and I'm a big believer in attacking it from a different angle. We know what it should look like. And again, I'm not talking about a 15 handicapper. I'm talking about a good player. So we got to create a signal into his brain to say, okay, that's what I'm trying to do. So um, obviously his foot wouldn't really do that in the golf swing, but his body wants to follow that. So now we get him into the swing and then he looks like that. 
and he starts really turning those hips and you can see where that club starts to swing. So here, now we'll go down more into the bottom here. And you can see these are him mapping out these patterns. And this is all using swing catalyst guys. This is him. All these guys understanding what forces that they should be feeling. So look at how different that body now is going to move because he understands exactly what a he needs to feel, which is the best part of swing cat or any force plate. Um, you know, you're, you're not telling this individual what to do. They're just doing it because of what they understand now. So if you look at that swing there now versus See, it might not be the one. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. There you go. So there versus there. Perfect. So now you kind of take a look at that for a moment, and you can really see the difference of impact based on how we got him there. Now, a little fun fact, he's playing the uh, senior junior, or he just finished up today doing the senior junior, and he shot four under on his front nine today on his ball. So um, clearly he kept the ball in front of him a little bit more. So all it took for this guy was under – he knew what he needed to do. Like I told him, I was like, dude, are you serious with this impact? <laughs> like you got you to gotta do something now. He's like, I know. I just – you know, everything that I try to do, I can't do it. And in reality, this is us just sticking for two hours, just drilling it and drilling it and drilling it and found him the feels um, that he went to. And then, you know, one of the guys that I showed him was a guy, you guys probably don't know this name unless you're from the, the New York area, but there's this guy, Nathan Hahn and Nathan, uh, maybe you, have you heard his name before? I have not. No. Okay. So Nathan plays for Columbia uh, and he's, just hit the transfer portal and he's going to be playing at Stanford next year. So Nathan's a really good player from the area. Um, but you'll see here again, another guy who used to hump the ball and watch how his hips work. Right. So again, just so you guys can see these things, and this is me just creating a specific look um, that's consistent across the board. But again, here's a guy who never had that turn. And now watch his follow through. You guys will appreciate this follow through. He cannot hit a ball left. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so again, you, you kind of, you know, the point of this call is to understand, you know, how people use swing cat. Um, you find, you find commonalities in specific, um, specific handicap players, right? So like I break it down into plus handicaps, from scratch to about a four or five, five to a 10 and so on and so forth. And you see commonalities, right? Like a guy who's a one or a two handicap that says I have a two way miss. He never gets open enough ever. I mean, it's, it is the definition of a guy not properly getting that body open enough um, or a guy like Ryan, right? A guy like Ryan, who's spraying it both ways, who is taking off all of his loft, you know, he's taking all of his loft off mainly because he's not getting to the top in the most efficient way. So he has to kind of manipulate it, if you will, on the way down or kind of fake it, if you will. So that's that. So uh, we just thank you so much. And that'll wrap this up. My thank pleasure, you. guys. Good luck with everything. And listen, anyone have any questions, don't, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank Appreciate you so it, much. Joe. You got it, boys. Have a good night. Get some sleep. Okay. You too. Bye.